UB News, all praise to the Most High. In the last video, we took a look at both the theory of evolution and the generations of man. First, according to science, and secondly, according to scripture. But which is true? The world of genetic science has developed a detailed process of evolution that follows humans supposedly for millions of years. However, the Old Testament details the generations of man beginning around 6,000 years ago. This contrasting information is at total odds with the scientific narrative, yet the Old Testament itself is the most recognized literature on earth. So what gives? Science says man evolved from monkeys and scripture says man is created. So which is true? We last left off following the lineages of man from Adam to Noah, through the flood, then through the division of the lands, and then after the Tower of Babel. According to scripture, there were three lineages that populated the earth post-flood. Those lineages, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So how does evolution fit into this theory? Were these men monkeys? If so, how were they so capable of building such massive structures? Were these men Neanderthal? Were these men Denisovans? Or were they just men? After the division of the lands and the disbursement of Babel, the sons of Noah began to war with one another and take each other captive. The agreement between Shem, Ham, and Japheth meant that their generations of children were given a certain portion of earth to dwell in and if any son of theirs were to break that oath their lineages would be cursed and removed from the holy remnant One of the most infamously controversial stories from the Bible are the details pertaining to the curse of Ham. Biblical scholars and historians have debated the exact specifications of this curse among themselves for generations. What exactly happened between Ham and Noah? What could have Ham done in order for Noah, a godly man of generations, to put a curse on him and his son. It seems as though the act that Ham committed upon his father has been hidden in context. Speculations have varied regarding Genesis 9 and some rabbis believe that Ham simply disrespected and mocked his naked drunken father and his mockery angered Noah to the point he even cursed his children. 
Still, some historians have asserted that the act of what Ham did to Noah was far more heinous than the missing literature alludes to. Several rabbinical authorities have agreed that the act that Ham performed on Noah was either one of two things. First and most common assertion put forth by the rabbinical clergy is that Ham or Canaan sodomized Noah while he was passed out in his tent or he was involved in some sort of homosexual act of emasculation. Secondly, there are some rabbis who say that Canaan saw Noah first, told his father, and this is why Canaan is mentioned in regard to the curse. Secondly, other rabbinical sources say Noah was looking to have another son to inherit his own portion and Ham castrated him. Either one of these extra biblical reasons would be a more fitting reason for Noah to curse Ham and Canaan. However, Noah isn't God, so if this curse was to come to fruition, would Noah, who is basically the post-flood Adam, have the authority to successfully put a hex on an entire generation of people? Or was this, in a way, a self-fulfilling prophecy? Many Christian historians have used this supposed curse on Ham not only to justify racism, but to justify slavery. This was a well entrenched Southern Christian doctrine beginning from the early 1700s. As many Christians were taught, dark skin was the result of Noah's curse on Ham. These Christian intellectuals asserted that all black people were descended from the line of Ham. Beyond the obvious genetic fallacy that black skin could possibly be a curse, skin color isn't mentioned as part of the curse at all associated with Ham, whether in the official canon or the apocryphal text. The reason that this declaration has been made by scientists and historians is because Ham is the progenitor of Cush according to Genesis and Cush is the progenitor of Nimrod and several ambiguous archaeological discoveries have been associated with Nimrod. These discoveries depict the image of a black man. So these Christian historians have associated Ham with all black people on earth. But the question at this time should be asked, were there any white people at this time? 
if there were, whose lineage was white. If a man had been capable of building great structures like the Tower of Babylon, which classical history puts in modern day Iraq, why were the cave people of Eurasia living so primitively at the same time? Were the Neanderthal sons of Noah? Concerning the Curse of Ham The Book of Jubilees provides more insight into the character of Ham and his son Canaan as it relates to the curse. Canaan broke the oath made between Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and invaded the lands of Shem and immediately starts to devile the land with abominations and idolatry. So even if the curse of Noah didn't stand, the oath had been broken and essentially Canaan cursed himself by committing this act of treason, thus becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Of the three sons of Noah, one seed has quickly identified itself as an obvious lineage of transgression. But how do the acts of this lineage play a role on world history? The only way to truly understand this is to take a deeper look into the lineage of Ham. Ham, or Ham, is the progenitor to several major players in world history, but it won't take long to find out that following this lineage is nearly an impossible task, and that is by design. Names have been changed and chronology rearranged. Following a sequential order of events will take you from the Torah to the Apocrypha to the Septuagint to the Egyptian Book of the Dead to Gnostic texts. This is all by design. One thing is extremely apparent throughout the entirety of scripture, lineages have been hidden and of course the line of ham is no exception one thing should be noted representations from each person in any lineage may be characterized by a single person but in most cases represents a group of people for example the sons of, and sometimes the daughters of. Ham had four sons, according to Genesis 10, Mitzrayim, Phut, Cush, and Canaan. Each son of Ham was given his lot during the division. Drawn among the ones who trade good judgment for a peace. Now in order to do this, we must pretend that the Americas don't exist and no one including God knew about a third of the world. So according to the classical narrative of nearly all historians, the entire world only consisted of the land around Europe and the Middle East and no one else and no where else existed.
the areas that were allotted to Ham and his sons were most of the area in Northeast Africa and the area described as the Lower Nile Valley. This area covers the territory of modern day Egypt, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. And the land of Canaan, a little further north, is modern day Palestine. And the land of Cush extended even over into the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates, separated by the supposed lands of Shem. Canaan was the first to break the oath and invaded the lands of Shem, took Shem's people captive and started committing abominations on the land. Ham is the supposed progenitor to the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Philistines, and the Canaanites. This lineage is often characterized as the line of evil and this evil lineage is supposedly attributed to all black people on earth but according to them how big is earth Etymologists define the word Japheth as meaning to expand. The territories allocated to Japheth are described as cold and to the north. However, in Hebrew, the word north means left, but that meaning has been flipped to the right, which means south. These territories allocated to the seven sons of Japheth were the lands of Europe and Central Asia, north of the Caucasus and Caspian Sea. The sons of Gomer, Ribath, Tugarma, and Ashkenaz occupied in particular the areas of modern day Crete into modern Russia. Most historians agree that this lineage is the progenitor of the Scythians. These Scythians include the past history of the Slavs, the Bulgars, the Khazars, and the Russian Empire. Also, this lineage includes the Armenians, the Turkish, the Germans, the Saxons, the Tartars, and the Scandinavians all descend from this ancestry. Getting even deeper into the Magog line, we have the Iranian, the Hindu, the Spaniard, and the Cretan. Is it possible for anyone to believe that this could be the line of evil? Genesis 9 Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. Genesis 10.5 by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. According to Genesis 10, these were the isles of the Gentiles and their divisions. Remember still at this time, 
the land of the Americas still has not been accounted for. But we have the generations of Japheth being mentioned immediately following the generations of Ham, and in between the mention of both the Isles of the Gentiles. Then at the end of chapter 10, it names the family of Shem and his sons and his divisions. At no point does it say that Shem's lands are on the Isles of the Gentiles. There is an underlying theme of geographic division that is deceptively missing from context. Most of this context is lost within the names of landmarks. Could this blessed lineage of Shem be included within the Isles of the Gentiles? This presumes also that the favored lineage was not only heavily mingled amongst Gentiles, but had been given far less and desirable land than brothers Japheth and Ham, while both brothers occupied millions of square mileage in Europe and Africa, literally continental sized land masses, Shem, who was from the favored lineage, was only allotted a minuscule piece of land in comparison. In addition, this also presumes that the Isles of the Gentiles are in no way geographically divided from the line of Shem. This presupposed geographical theory is the key behind the overall deception. If the earth was divided into three parts, why are only two parts of world history being told? They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. In this passage, the quote, which are not a people, is a clear indication that there is a distinction of genetic difference between the lineage of Shem and the nation, which are not a people. And speaking of not people, what about the genetic codes carried by the three sons after the flood? Had their genes been corrupted? We already know bloodlines were corrupted by Cain and the following. But is there any indication within the Bible that the beast of the field had also been corrupted? Could there have been a possibility that the beast of the field is part of a genetic code of either three of the sons of Noah? Hybrid culture was a popular part of Greek mythology and ancient Babylonian mysticism. These were the first deities worshipped on earth by the sons of Ham and later Japheth. The titles of the hybrid entities have changed several times over several generations, but the entities each deity represents have never changed. In Genesis we know that the Watchers, aka the Fallen Angels, transgressed their duties against the Most High and lay with daughters of men. These daughters begat mighty children. These children were known as the Nephilim. 
we know that the Watchers and Seraphim are a particular class of angels. We can establish that they appear as multi-headed beasts in the book of Jasher and Enoch, going even deeper into the theory of hybridization. And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other, therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon earth, all men and all animals. And the Lord said, I will blot out man that I created from the face of the earth, yea, from man to the birds of the air, together with the cattle and the beasts that are in the field, for I repent that I made them. And all the men who walked in the ways of the Lord died in those days before the Lord brought the evil upon man, which he had declared. So we now have scriptural proof that there are at least two, maybe three genetic variations in the bloodlines of men. And these variations are the serpent seed from the ancestral line of Cain, the Nephilim seed from the fallen, which could also represent the serpent seed, seeing as the serpent was considered an angelic class being before the deception of Adam. And finally, the beasts of the field air and water apparently this was the corruption that preceded the flood the giants turned against them and devoured mankind and they began to sin against the birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. End quote. Not only had the seed been corrupted, but this passage alludes to the fact that the giants were the ones who began the corruption of the beast, birds, reptiles, and fish, which initiates an early connection between the bloodline of the Nephilim and the earthly beasts of the field. Since the beginning of Greek and Babylonian civilization, there has been a documented major fascination with hybridization. The first deities to emerge out of Sumer in the Akkadian histories were indeed zoomorphic. Tremendously massive, elaborate statues of half-men, half-beasts were erected to worship and make sacrifices to. Each deity in the Sumerian pantheon represented a particular luminary, and the top three deities represented different constellations. An individual god is associated with each luminary. The luminary is characterized by a deity, an associated color, and metal. For example, the patron deity of Babylon Marduk is associated with the planet Jupiter, the color white, and the metal tin. These characteristics of Sumerian gods are eerily familiar to the line of the fallen through their association with luminaries or metals. For we know it was the fallen who taught men how to fashion metal into weapons and make war. 
And the book of Enoch clearly makes a point to connect the imprisonment of the fallen with the wandering suspension of the luminaries. As well as the Babylonians, the Greek had their own gang of hybrided gods, also resembling the functions and features of the Mesopotamians. If we just take the understood history of the Greek people through their own religious mythology, they will tell you themselves without equivocation that they are indeed descended from gods and titans. For the Greek, their Adam and Eve story begins with Uranus and Gaia. For the Greek, Gaia is considered the mother of all mankind and a primordial deity. According to the story, Uranus was conceived by Gaia alone. Yet later, they would conceive a child together, Cronus, and the birth of the first generations of Titans were born on Earth. As the story goes, Cronus, for whatever reason, castrates his father with a sickle. He then chucks his father's sickled sack into the sea. From the contents within the sack, Gaia produces Aphrodite. Cronus would later impregnate his mother Gaia and his sister Rhea and birth into the world the second generation well, first and a half generation of inbred giants now walks the earth. Not very long after the flood, the bloodlines of Japheth have clear indications of Nephilim shenanigans and propensity for evil. Did I mention Cronus? Cronus ate his children, which means he ate his nephews and his grandchildren because they are the same people. Within the lineage of Gaia and Cronus sits the entire pantheon of Greek gods, all taking various form, all having various powers. Gaia's children were monsters, a cyclops, a multi-headed beast with the strength of ten titans. Gaia also had extremely fair daughters whose purposes were to pleasure and torment men. This lineage has a unique amalgamation of varying genetic mutations from one-eyed cannibal giants with demon blood to multi-armed beasts with triple road toothless. The questions and stories surrounding Gaia are fanatical and mythological, or in other words, scientific. A woman who was part giant demon has a child with another giant, and they go on to produce a lineage of world conquering demon babies. 
with such impeccably tight bloodlines, a mad king must be born every generation, if not a total alien. These are the progenitors of the Greek people according to their histories and their customs. This lineage echoes of Prometheus and Gaia is the womb in which to genetically perfect a beast. 